To those of you outside of our church, this, of course, is a vacation season uh, time that you'll be gone. We'll be right here when you get back. So remember us and be praying for us, if you will, please. And certainly, if, you have, if you're in a location where you can watch it, that's fine, or listen to it either way. We do this all the time, and we want to put out every service that we do. And it's a labor of love. It, it is. It's a labor of love, considered as missions of the two missionaries on the wall in here, uh, doing the job of sending the gospel out. And that's what we just kind of consider it that way. We certainly do. Okay, if you will please just look, if you will please, at, to, at the last part of your book there that you've got in number one. Let's go to the first thing right here. We're talking here about the lukewarm church. We've been, we've been opening the door to that. We're going to be talking about that a little bit tonight. In the middle of the last days that we're in, that we're studying, in the lukewarm spirit with commitment, sporadic, but it's... It, you, I think we can understand that the church is cooling down. It's not any excuse to do it, but that's worldwide. That's what's happening. In that time period is when the Bible says that Jesus will return. That is why a lot of people say that we are in those last days. Because it is that time when actually we can see a lukewarm cooling down of the, of the church. Uh, the true possessing church will be taken away in the rapture. The false professing church will continue right on into the tribulation. Um, in my studies, I have tried to come up with the way I feel it's going to be done as best I can tell. And I have tried my best to study it out because I know people want to know and there's no way that I can tell. People say this, this is the way it's going to be. They don't, they don't know. We don't know. We really don't know. Uh, we do know that the apostles themselves figured that they were in the latter days. They considered themselves in the latter days. Uh, then John talks about what's going on. Paul talked about what's going on. Uh, the apostles considered themselves to be in the last days. Uh, they could read the scripture just like you and I can and whether it was the latter days or not at that time, we, we know that it wasn't, but they didn't know. Now we've got a couple of terms that we need to get straightened out. Number one, I never have thought that the Lord Jesus coming is immediate. It's always, in my terminology, been that it could come at any time, at any point, but not necessarily immediate. My professor at school said he may not come for another million years. I think he's going to, but it is imminent. There's a big difference in immediate and imminent. Imminent means that the Lord could come at any moment. And they were expecting him to come back in the Bible days. Even the apostles were expecting, Lord, they, when are you coming back, Lord? Are you going at this time, even when he was about to ascend into heaven? Lord, at this time, are you going to establish the kingdom? Is this the time you're going to do that? They were looking for it right then. So they, were, they thought they were in the latter days. Uh, they have been, and so the latter days have been all along. Uh, it just has not been imminent at that time. I know the Lord Jesus Christ could come at any point, at any time. He could, but he hasn't. He just hasn't. So it's not an immediate coming. As I began studying on it, I tried to figure it out. I tried to figure, just like everybody else, I wanted to know, everybody wanted to know who's this, who's this going to be and all this kind of stuff. And I just, I, I'd have to say, I don't know. I, and I didn't know. I knew very little because I was told as a coming along, as I first started, you can't understand it. You can't understand the, the second coming, so uh, people need to know other things, but they don't. you can't understand it anyhow, and you'll get confused and get them confused, so stay away from it. Uh, Well-meaning people advise me of that. I hope I've never advised you of that, so I, because that was, it was wrong of them to do it. And people that I had a lot of, a lot of uh, confidence in, they told me I could never understand it. When I went down to the Bobby Church, I was teaching the young people down there. My mom was teaching the ladies and dad was teaching the men. And I had the young people. And then there was another class of the little bitty babies and stuff, little, little children. 
But they all want to, they want to know about the second coming. They, they want to know. And I had to figure it out. I had to start studying on it. I mean, I, you got to know more than anybody else because you don't know what questions you're going to have. So I had all my charts and I had all this, the vials and the bowls and the trumpets and all the judgments going to come down and everything. It's very impressive. But I was really trying my best to figure out how I can, how I can get sense out of something that barring a miracle working God, you can't figure it out. Uh, how is it possible for him to come back again at any point. I, I just didn't know. I just, I just had to say, I, I don't know. But I knew that I was in the last days. I knew that. That's all that I did know. I would ask any Sunday school teacher that I ever ran across, didn't matter who they were or who she was, what, what do you think about Gog and Magog? What, what, who, what is that? What's going on here? And I had all kinds of people telling me all kinds of things. This is what it means. This is what it means. Uh, we had preachers that came through a uh, temple down there, and they were all identifying who the Antichrist, well, I say all, many of them were identifying who the Antichrist is. This is back in the 70s. Henry Kissinger was the, the one of choice, <laughs> the one that was usually chosen to be the Antichrist because he is a Syrian Jew. He's a Jewish man from Syria, and so he fit the bill. And so he, he had just hashed out a... Uh, Vietnam, uh, vet or vet or Vietnam peace treaty and so forth. So he was a prime candidate. He, uh, but I said, this doesn't, this doesn't make sense to me. It just, I just don't understand it. And so I continued to study. I continued to ask people. I continued to read. I was very careful who I, who I, re who I read after. And, that, and you should be too. Uh, I've tried to give you some information as to people to read after and who not to read after, and that's part of what we're going to be dealing with here in this study. But the, the disciples considered themselves to be in the middle of the, of the latter days, okay? Now, in 1 John chapter 2, in verse 18, John said it this way, Little children, it is the last day, as you have heard that Antichrist shall come. Now, all this is in your, in your lesson number one. Even now there are many antichrists whereby we know that it is the last time. He also says in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 1, The Spirit speaks expressly, In the latter days some shall depart from the faith by giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. Some shall depart from the faith. And that sum is becoming more and more and more as we get on into it. Doing what? Verse 2. Speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. What does it mean to have your conscience seared? It's embedded in there. Embedded? The, sear, the searing is the sealing part. When you sear a steak, you seal the juices on the inside. It, the hot iron is when you, when you seal it in, and their consciences are seared as if with a hot iron, speaking lies in hypocrisy. And those lies are there. You, you tell a lie enough, you, somebody's going to believe it. I mean, let's face it, uh, you, you can do that now. Who was it? Was it Hitler? Who was it said that? You tell a lie enough, people will believe it. I, some famous personality, whatever it was. You, you tell a lie about me enough, people are going to believe it. And uh, tell a lie about you. I've even heard some stuff about Jordan. <laughs> no, I, I, I'll be honest with you, brother, I never have, to be honest with you. They don't talk to me about it because they know how I feel about you. Speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their consciences seared. He says in 2 Timothy 3, This know also, know this also, in the last days perilous times shall come. Anybody got another word for that? If you, I don't know if you're even looking at the Bible or not, or if you're just reading along here. Perilous times mean wacky, crazy, haywire times. Perilous times shall come. Men shall be lovers of their own selves, conceited, covetous, boasters or braggers, Proud, haughty, blasphemy, disobedient to parents or insubordinate, unthankful, 
unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, slanderers, incontinent, uninhibited, fierce, savage, despisers of those that are good. He goes on to say, turn away, turn away from that. Turn away from those. Don't listen to that. Don't, don't be involved in that at all. And then a very important scripture that we've mentioned a time or two, but hadn't really dealt with in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 3. Through covetousness, they will make merchandise of you. What's going through your mind? These false teachers will make merchandise of you. What what was that what was that speaking? What was that talking to you about? They'll make merchandise of you. Any thoughts? They'll make merchandise of you with fabricated words. In other words, you're just a piece of meat. You're just a can on the shelf. You, you don't matter. You, they'll make merchandise, something to be bought and sold, something to be given away, something to, to be traded, whatever. They'll make merchandise of you. Uh, have, you ever seen, have you ever seen such belittling of Christians today? Uh, I saw some famous politician on the news. I have no idea what her, what her title was or whatever. But she was talking about how these people... I think it was in that, that Loudoun County, Virginia thing that's going on up there, the school board, talking about these Christians dripping their hate, dri with their hate dripping from their lips and stuff. In other words, they don't count. Don't listen to them. And that's what the Bible says for us to do to them. <laughs> don't, they don't count. They make merchandise of you. Their judgment of old does not linger doesn't, in other words, it doesn't hang, it keeps going, keeps moving, and their damnation is not asleep. That brings us to the end of chapter of lesson number one. I ask you to read uh, for tonight, I ask you to read chapters two and three of the book of the Revelation. Chapters two and three, I think, are written chronologically by virtue of the churches of a particular time period. Now, this is not original with me. I read after people like Thomas Ice and Randall Price and Hal Lindsey. I read after Hal Wilmington. I read about John Wolverd. Uh, I, read about, I read after these people that I have confidence in. Uh, some of them have gone a little bit weird. I've, some of them I've had to kind of say, well, I, I better back off of that one just a little bit there because I'm not really sure about that. But I do believe and I do go along with the fact that the Bible, as it records those seven letters to those seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3, are recording periodic history of the church age. Starting with the church of Ephesus, which is a first love church, and right on up, Philadelphia, Sardis, Smyrna, all the rest of them, till we get to the last one. And it's no mistake that the last church is the one that is going to be in effect when Jesus comes. And it's the lukewarm church. It is the lukewarm church. In Revelation 3, 14, 15, and 16, to the messenger of the church of the Laodiceans. Now that is a town. Laodicea is a town. Jordan preached a serious ser message on these, uh, these seven churches. So this is the First Baptist Church of Laodicea, uh, the First Baptist Church of Ephesus, First Baptist Church of Philadelphia, First Baptist Church of, of uh, Smyrna, and, and all the rest of it. That's not all the churches over there. There are lots of churches in that area. that they, He only chose seven of them. Thessalonica is not in this. Uh, Philippi is not in this. Athens is not in this. Corinth is not in this. Uh, there's a lot of churches that were not chosen, but he chose seven the Holy Spirit told uh, John to write these letters here. And he says to the messenger of the church of the Laodiceans, here's what you need to write. These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I would like for you to be either cold or hot. But because you're lukewarm, 
I will spew you out of my mouth. What he's saying there is that the church in the last days will be not on fire for God, but not ice cold. Just kind of get along to get along. That kind of attitude, just kind of, just kind of drifting along like a, what's the word, that, that song? Drifting along with a tumbling tumbleweed, just moving down the way the wind blows. Whichever way the wind blows, that's the way a lot of churches go. Half-hearted, complacent, smug, self-reliant, independent, even independent of Christ. Broad-minded, very proud of the fact that we're broad-minded. We're, uh, we, what's the word that they use? Uh, big, big platform. We can, we can in, in, incorporate all different faiths, different, all different beliefs. We can bring them all in, broad-minded, stand for nothing, fall for everything. This condition of things makes Jesus Christ what? Sick. Makes him sick. I'll spew you out of my mouth. That's the way it's going to be in the latter days. Now, I echo what the last what people say from the back seat. Are we there yet? Uh, not going to spend an awful lot of time on it because you already know that we are. But I found some statements that I want to bring to you. Since 1900, denominations in general in America have become increasingly more and more liberal in their theology. A liberal theologian is one that does not believe in the miracles. This is one of the things that they would, this is one way you can tell if a person is uh, to the liberal side. Does he believe that the axe head floated? Does he believe that the Red Sea parted? Does he believe that uh, uh, the miracles took place? Uh, does he try to explain it? Do they say, well, there was an earthquake and the water dammed up on the Jordan River and that's the way it happened. Trying to explain these things. This is happening and you will see this going on all over the place. How uh, can you be a preacher and preach the I mean, that makes God insignificant. Because of the seminaries. That's who's been training these preachers down through the years. Uh, you, it's, it's very hard to find a very, it's very hard to find a fundamental seminary now. Very difficult. There are some, and I could recommend them to you, but uh, no, they, the teachers in the seminaries are products of the seminaries, which are products of the seminaries, so they keep duplicating themselves. I agree with you, Denise. It's just one of those things that you couldn't, but I, if I could explain to you how the, the Red Sea or the Jordan River was parted, that you could understand, I can explain the miracles. It's very difficult to understand how that God would do that unless you believe he, believed he did a miracle. You don't have to explain these things. But uh, if I can explain it, you'll say, why, well, you know stuff. I don't know beans. I don't know beans about it if I, if I don't believe in the miracles. Uh, did the axe head float? That's a question you can ask anybody. Did the axe head, the Bible says that the axe head float. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? What, what, it, what, it, what am I talking about? The axe head floating. Relate for me what that was all about. Anybody? Who's involved there? Okay. Yeah. Uh, he, he says, I, I've lost my axe head. I've lost my power. And so, you know, they threw the branch into the tree and the axe head floated. It says in the King James, the axe head swam. Now, I don't believe it swam. I, you know, I don't... Uh, but I do believe it floated. It just came right up and you say, well, that's impossible. Iron came. Well, then how else would you explain it other than a miracle if you have to explain it away? And so these people have a serious problem trying to explain the miracles of God. Uh, they, and they do. They, they do try to do that. So I'm going to ask you, skip one, Jordan, keep looking up. Keep looking up. Remember, Something I heard somebody say, you are the best Christian somebody knows. And you might be the only Christian somebody knows. You know what a rhino is, R-I-N-O. Be careful about being a sino, C-I-N-O, Christian in name only. 
When somebody looks at you, me, us, let's make sure that they're looking at the real thing. Somebody who believes in, in the ax head floating or swimming if you want to. But the simple truth is, we believe that Jesus Christ is coming. That's what I'm gonna to talk to you about just in a few moments, the rest of the time that we have, okay? Any thoughts or comments? I gave you the book number two. I ask you to read ahead on it because I have no idea how long we'll take on it, but not as long as we took on number one. Give me that chart there. This is, this is lesson number two. I've been looking for a good chart that was, see, I, I miss my overhead projector. I do, I, I, miss, I miss my drawing the charts and stuff. That I, uh, we've got one around here somewhere, but it probably got thrown away in this, <laughs> this, all this stuff that's been going on here. But I, I love being able to draw the charts. So I found this one and I said, boy, that's great. That's, that's, that's a great chart, okay? Let's just look at the chart and talk about it, any questions that you might have. Everything hinges on the cross, okay? Everything on the cross. Jesus went to the cross, the church began. The age of the church began. Everything hinges on the, on the cross of Christ Jesus, okay? So that starts right here. Usually they put the cross in the middle, but I like the fact that they put it right over here. Then we have a period of time right in here which has gone now for oh, about 2,000 years. Remember the Jewish calendar is not the same as our calendar. On our calendar, it's 2021. Um, the Jewish calendar is not quite the same. But still in all, it's been about 2,000, a little over 2,000 years since that all took place. So let's just call it 2,000. They say 2,003 uh, times years right here. The age of the church, this period of time right here, we're in right now. If we are in the, right there, right here on the timeline, then we're close. We're very, very close. We might be over here. My professor said, uh, don't, get yourself in a corner on this thing, he may not come for another million years. I don't believe that he's gonna wait that long, but Jesus, can, Jesus will come when the Father says to come. That, that, that's what happens. It's the Jewish wedding. Remember, if you will please, in the Jewish wedding, the son goes to get the bride when the Father says go. The son does not even know when he's gonna go. He goes when the father says, son, go get your bride. And he leaves his father's home and comes to the home of the bride to get her. You see that in the five wise and the five foolish virgins, the parables that Jesus told. The five wise and the five foolish virgins, they were all virgins, so they were all going to the wedding but five of them were wise because they had oil in their lamps, right? Five were foolish because they didn't have any oil. It's not that they didn't have enough knowledge. They were there. They were waiting on the groom to come. They were ready for the wedding. They probably had their wedding garments on. They just didn't have any oil in the lamp. They couldn't, they couldn't trim their wicks because they hadn't gotten fully prepared. So when the word came out, behold, the bridegroom cometh, the father has told the son who lives across town or wherever he lives, go get your bride. He shows up at midnight or whenever, it's time, whenever, and says, come out, come up here, come to me. And she comes to, she comes to you, she comes to, to him. Remember what the Bible says, they went out. They trimmed their wicks and went out to meet the bridegroom. They left their home and went out to meet the bridegroom. The others did not go because they didn't have any oil. All right, it's the Jewish wedding all over again. When Jesus is talking to, to the, the people after the Lord's Supper, after the, the, the events in the, the upper room, He's going on his way. He, he spends some time from the upper room over to the Garden of the Gethsemane. He's giving them a Bible study as he goes. And he says, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going to go to prepare a place for you. And if I do, and we know he did, right? If I go to prepare a place for you, if I do, I will come again and receive you unto myself. I've said it many times. It's time to say it again. Every one of those men knew clearly what he was saying. 
I know that when we propose to our wives, we say, will you marry me, or will you wear my ring, or you won't get married, or whatever you, whatever you say, whatever. <laughs> what did you say, Dwayne? What, how did you beg her to marry you? <laughs> oh, she, well, I, now, I've been saying that for, for a long time about Nita, but I've been lying the whole time, <laughs> as, you all, as you all know. But anyhow, th th what happened in the Bible days is when you had an, a wedding that was arranged, you would talk to the girl and say, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I do, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That's the way it was done. In my father's house are many mansions. I'm going there to prepare a place for us. And when I come back again, we, I, I will receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. They all knew what that meant when Jesus said that in John 14. He was talking about coming again. But they knew exactly what that was talking about because he's the bridegroom and we are part of the bride. Okay? That's, that's so clear. When I saw that, everything started lining up. I was, I was concerned because I read where the Bible says that Jesus is coming like a thief in the night. And then I read where Jesus is coming and every eye shall see him. And I says, well, duh, how can that be? And I began to figure these things out. See, nobody, I didn't, I didn't have a lot of help to figure all this stuff out. I, my pastor just, when I confessed my call to preach, he said, you start tonight. And that was it. Turn me loose. Turn the devil loose on me and all the rest of it. I don't want to do that to any of the preachers in our church like that. But that's exactly the way it was done. I, I, had, no, I had no clue what to do. I didn't know about funerals, weddings, or anything of the nature of the sort. But the simple truth, let me turn this phone off right quick before it goes off again. Sorry about that. All right. Sorry. Oh, by the way, turn your cell phones. <laughs> Put your cell phones on vibrate. Uh, where was I? Uh, I? I didn't know. So I had to study these things out. And when I saw that it's all according to a plan, it, it began to make sense to me. And I began to read the, the right kind of people, the right kind of read, or, uh, writers, and it began to make a lot of sense. I found me a chart. It looks something like this right here. I used to draw it out. You come in right here. We're living at this point. At some point out there in the future, don't know when. You don't either. Jesus said, hey, I don't even know. Now we'll say this. Jesus said, no one knows except the Father. Now, I have kind of come to the conclusion since studying and so forth, that he gave them a lot of information between the resurrection and the ascension. He, he began to talk to them and gave them a lot of information that they didn't know before. I wrote it in the Easter play, and as I looked at it again and again and again, I said, I think that's probably what he would have said. I'm going to enlarge your minds. I'm going to broaden your mind. Jesus told them, I'm going to enlarge your minds. I'm going to help you here in this period of time before this ascension took place. I don't know if you remember that in the drama or not, but they were all standing around. Lord, will you at this time uh, set up the kingdom? He says, I'm going to broaden your minds now. I want to show you some things which must come to pass. I think maybe that Jesus was really hinting about some things, maybe that he had not been able to share before. You see, Jesus spoke in parables. And the reason why he did is so that people who seriously wanted to understand could understand it. But people who didn't really want to wouldn't. Now you say, that's cruel. Well, to be quite honest with you, you've got to want to learn. You really got, you, teachers, all teachers will tell you this. You, the kids have got to want to learn. You can't drill it into them. You can't, you can't make them, the old expression, you lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Um, Jesus taught in parables. And some of them got it and some of them didn't. He got, some of them got this and some of them didn't. And I'm thinking that's, this is exactly the way we need to approach this. He probably knew a little bit more. Well, he knew a whole lot more than we do. But he probably knew a little bit more than he was willing to say before this time came around. After the resurrection, he was free. 
He was going up. He was enlisting his replacements. They're going to be in charge. Peter, Paul, John, Matthew, Mark, Luke. These are the ones that are going to write the New Testament. And they're going to be in charge of the church. And so uh, he's, uh, he's, he's given them a little bit of information there. Whenever that is, wherever that occurs, whenever that occurs, we don't know when. Let's just say that it occurs tonight. It's 6.30. Let's just say that this will take place at 6.45. And just, just, it may be 6, 6.30 and a half. It, it's liable to just like that, you know. But whenever it does, whenever that happens, something is going to be set in motion right here. Most people agree. Most people agree that there is coming a time known as the tribulation. Now, as I learned about the second coming of Christ, I believed in the second coming. I, I, I believed in it all my life. I just didn't know anything about it. But I have believed in it. I believed that Jesus was coming back. It's one of the five fundamentals of the faith. The, the virgin birth, the inspired word of God, the, the uh, substitutionary death, the resurrection, and the coming again. We don't always agree. Now, I think probably in the church we probably do here. But outside of our church, a lot of people who might be watching this right now, you might not necessarily agree with the timing of this. We're not going to agree with all the details of this. But at some point, at some point, there is going to be a period of time known as the tribulation. Now, that's biblical. At some point, it's going to have to fit in there somewhere. It's got to fit in between the time Jesus comes and when he sets up his kingdom. It's got to fit in there somewhere because the Bible talks about the tribulation and the great tribulation. So for the time being, don't try to put it into the the timetable. Let's just, let's just see where it fits in. If it fits in right there, it comes before the millennial kingdom. Can you see that? If it comes before the thousand year kingdom, that is a pre-millennial tribulation. Pre meaning before the millennium. Okay, if, if it comes before, there are people who do not accept that. There are people who do not accept the fact that it comes before the tribulation, before the millennial kingdom. But if it comes here before the thousand year kingdom, then that is called a premillennial tribulation time. There are other people who believe that this right here occurs over here at the end. At the end, of the millennial kingdom. These are people who believe that we are in the kingdom age now. There are songs, church songs, that reflect that. I don't believe that we'll be in that thousand years. Oh, yes, 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 indeed, we will. Huh? Oh, yes, very much alive, more alive than we are now. Don't get ahead of me. Yeah, we'll be right there. Christians will. Uh, so, I mean, but again, that's not for us, but we will be right there. There are those right now that believe that we, will, that we are in the, the millennial kingdom now. There's a song that goes, uh, we have a story to tell to the nations. Papa, I've forgotten the name of it now, how it goes. It says, the darkness shall turn to dawning and the dawning till noonday sun, then Christ shall come. It's in, our, it's in our hymn book. The darkness shall turn to dawning, and the dawning to noonday sun, then Christ shall come. Well, doesn't the Bible say that He will come in a moment that you think not? Doesn't the Bible say that? Okay, then how do we reconcile these thoughts here? If, if it's going to get better and better and better, and then Christ will come, shouldn't we be getting better and better and better now? If He's going to come in the next few moments? There are those that teach that. Quite frankly, not too many since World War II. And actually, World War I stopped a lot of that. Because when World War I came, which was called the Great War, it wasn't World War I when they were in it, 
They didn't know there was going to be a World War I and II, but the Great War, they were looking for, the people were preacher, preachers were talking about how it's going to get better and better and better, and all of a sudden, bingo, the world's at war. So a lot of people begin to look askance at that and say, you know, that, this is not supposed to happen. But then we got over it, and then we came back, and then all of a sudden, Hitler started again, and we're in World War II. So generally speaking, after World Wars I and II, there's not very many people that say that the world's going to get better and better and better. Matter of fact, the Bible says it's going to get worse and worse. Clearly. The evil men and seducers shall get worse and worse and worse. So clearly, it's going to start getting worse and worse and worse. So that pretty well is wiped out. Okay? There are those who believe that Jesus Christ is going to come right here before the tribulation. There are those that believe that Jesus Christ is going to come after the tribulation and before the millennium. And there are people that believe that Jesus Christ is going to come after the millennium. They all have titles. This one will be called pre-tribulation, pre-millennial. This would be pre-post-tribulation, uh, pre-millennial. This would be post-millennial, post-tribulation. They all have titles that they, that they have different viewpoints. There are writing people, right? people who have written uh, books. We had to read them in seminary. We read some of the post-millennial teachings that the people have. There's not very many people writing now, but that, there are all kinds of different people. There are some that believe, and I've run across this, there are some that believe that he's going to come in the middle of the tribulation event because it is divided up into two unequal parts, remember? Three and a half years and a little less than three and a half years. There are those that, that teach that Jesus is going to come at the middle here. They are called mid-tribulation rapturists. So these different people have different ideas and different thoughts. Uh, I want to know. I ask God to... Lord, I want to know. I, I really want to know. If I'm going to be a pastor, and if you want me to, if you want me to preach from Revelation and stuff, and, and I feel like you do, and I, I really need to know. I really do. And so I have come to the conclusion that there are some basic things that just make good sense. Whether it's a miracle or not, it just makes good sense. I happen to be a pre tribulation, and pre-millennial rapturist. I believe at some point right there, Jesus is going to come. Uh, secret, surprise, uh, behold the bridegroom cometh. Those that are ready, go up to meet him in the air. 1 Thessalonians 4. The Bible talks about we shall, we shall be, we'll be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Now, if somebody is caught up, that means that somebody's left behind. Can we agree on that? If, something, if some of them are caught up, then others are going to be left behind. What you need to do is to figure out now who's left behind. Is it going to happen right here? Who's left behind? Whoever it is are going to go into the tribulation, aren't they? If they're left behind, they're going to go into the tribulation. So, we have to ask the question, what is the purpose of the tribulation? Why is that coming? There's no doubt in, your, in our minds at all, the Bible clear about this, and when you read the book to there, we'll, we'll get to it. There's no doubt it's going to happen. Clearly, that's, what, that's a biblical term, tribulation and great tribulation. So why, why is there this awful period of time? If you study that out and see it, it begins to make sense. Anybody want to take a shot? The extended grace of God. Again, if you if you if you say that yes, yeah, and there will be people saved in the tribulation time. Yes, there will be some. Not as much as I personally believe that Tim LaHaye's book, The Left Behind series, talk about. I, I, I really kind of fell out with that, but I think that's done more harm than it's done good about that. But anyhow, the, 
there will be people who will be saved. I don't know who they are. Uh, I, I don't know who that's going to be. I, all of them. But I do know who most of them are going to be. And they're going to be Jewish people. That's basically what that tribulation is all about. Now again, I don't want to bore you with details and facts and figures and all that kind of stuff because I've only got five more minutes here. But the tribulation is a period of time in which God is going to deal with His people, the Jewish people. That's the purpose of the tribulation. Why have they been mistreated and abused so much? Why? What's going on with them that we need to know about? When you get that figured out, you'll begin to see what's going to happen here. Uh, it's, it's not just necessarily because they crucified Christ. They didn't crucify Christ. Me and you crucified Christ. It was, it was our sins that crucified Jesus Christ. They, they didn't drive the nails. The Romans did that. So people blame the Jewish people for crucifying Jesus. No, no, we did that. So there's, there's, there's a way that there's, you, you have to understand that, and we'll get to that. But something's going to happen during the tribulation time. It's going to be, I personally believe, a time when, Jesus, when God is going to be dealing with the Jewish people specifically. If there are any Gentiles, watch this real close, if there are any Gentiles on the earth at the time of the tribulation, where did they come from? They had to have been unsaved at this point right here. The saved people go up. The bride goes up. The bride is called out. Who's left behind? Remember those three groups of people that we talked to you about? Those three groups of people that there are in the earth right now? They are Jew, Gentile, and what? Church. Church. Right. If the church goes up at that point, who's left behind? Jews and, Jews and unsaved Gentiles. Or they're Gentiles, they're all Gentiles. So it's a shame and a disgrace that there are any Gentiles. It's a shame and a disgrace there's going to be anybody there. But there will be because it's basically that God is going to deal with the Jewish people about one little thing He's still got to deal with them about. We'll get to that when we get to it, okay? And you already know what it is, so it won't be any shock to you. But Jews and, Gentile, Jews and Gentiles will be left behind right here. Christians are gone. Nobody goes into the tribulation but unsaved people and Jewish people. The preachers will all be Jewish. And many of them will see the Christ as their Messiah and receive Him and become believers in the Christ that they're not believers in right now. That leaves, the, that leaves the unsaved Gentiles right there. Now, we'll be talking about that as we come on. Time's about to run out here. Uh, who, goes into the, who goes into the millennial kingdom? The millennial kingdom is not for the Jewish people. The millennial kingdom is for Gentiles. People who know the Lord Jesus Christ. Take your Bibles to Matthew 25. You don't have to do it right now. But at Matthew 25 where he says, Come ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Blessed of my Father would indicate that they're believers in Christ, right? So at that point, here we go. At that point right there, there is another separation right here there's a great separation the Christians are taken and some are left behind there's another separation right here some are taken and some are left behind that's what lesson two is going to be about okay any thoughts or comments about that thus far that's what I had a terrible time getting figured out and I don't want to, I, I, I don't have time to, to go into it right now. But some are left behind. Let's just say it this way. In the rapture of the church, I know the word does not appear in your Bible. I know that. Everybody knows that. The word rapture does not. The idea does. 
But the word Trinity does not appear there either. But uh, there will be people who will be taken away and some will be left. If the Christians are taken and some will be left at the rapture, then out here when Jesus comes back to the earth, who's going to be taken who's going to be left? There's going to be some taken, going to be some left. Jewish people will be taken and there will be some left. All right? Just hang in there. Hang in there. You say, well, boy, that's, you're, you're weaving quite a web there. Yeah, it takes that to really understand why this is going to happen. What's it going to be? When Jesus comes the first time, when I, when I ask you, uh, when I have people ask me, said, uh, what time does your church start? I say, Sunday school's at 10, and the preaching service is at 11. It's all part of church. But it's in two parts. The second coming of Christ is in two parts. He's coming in the clouds secretly and calls His people up to meet Him in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And then He's coming back to the earth. That's the revelation. This is the rapture. That's the revelation. That's the second coming of Christ over here when He's coming back to come back to the earth and set up the kingdom age. Any thoughts or comments? That second time, is it only Jews that will be saved? There'll be no Gentiles in there? There will be some Gentiles, yes. That are saved and taken up again? Won't be taken up. If they're, if they're saved during the tribulation, they'll go into the millennial kingdom as a believer. Oh yes. And they will go into the land. Into the kingdom. The, the, into the kingdom. The ones that are sealed, the ones that Please understand. Also Gentiles that have been saved during that. There will be Gentiles that go in there as a believer. They're not Christian because they don't go up. They'll go into the kingdom age. Um, you this this is this is a difficult part to understand, okay? Uh, the Jewish people, their goal is to inherit the earth. The Christian's goal is to what? Go to heaven. That's, that's the difference. That's, you have to understand that. That's always been the difference. Any other thoughts or comments? Go ahead. Are the Christians that are taken up at the rapture going to return? Yep. Uh huh. It's, it's like a wedding. You go to the wedding. The bridegroom calls you out. The bride goes to the bridegroom's home in my father's house are many mansions, dwelling places. The wedding will be taken. The wedding will be, and they'll have about a seven-year reception, the marriage supper of the Lamb, and then come back to the home of the bride. Come back to the home of the bride to establish the kingdom age. When you see that, it just makes sense. It begins, it begins to make a whole lot more sense than this helter-skelter idea of saying, I don't believe, I don't know where that's coming from. Don't, don't jump ahead of me now, just hang in there. Any other thoughts or comments? Carolyn, you've been thinking that. Come on. Um, thinking about the, the influence of the Holy Spirit during that tribulation about. Right. That's exactly right. So, so people, even though they'll see the destruction of the world essentially around them, they will not have that tugging on their heart from the Holy Spirit. That's exactly right. They'll be on their own to make those decisions. It will be just like it was in the Old Testament. The gospel of the kingdom. That's right. It, at that tribulation time will be just like it was in the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit worked in the Old Testament, but not like He is now. Not like He came to stay at Pentecost. And it's the gospel of the kingdom that will be being preached, not the gospel of grace, the gospel of salvation. It's a different, it's a different kind of preaching. It goes back to the way it was in the, in the Old Testament. The millennial kingdom will go back to the way it was like it was in the Garden of Eden. Life will be extended. People will live hundreds of years just like it was in the Garden of Eden. There will be people dying, yes. 
But if you die at 120, you will be considered a baby. That, that is tough. That is tough, and I, let, let's, let's, let's spend one minute on that. You would think, wouldn't you think, I think you would think, I certainly think, if I had lived a thousand years with perfection, you would think that when the devil is turned loose a little while, that people would say, uh -uh, I don't want no part of that. I've had a taste of the kingdom age. But they flock to him by the droves because their hearts have not been changed. That's how evil people are. That's a good point, Dwayne. Thank you for bringing that up. Anything else? It's all going to jump in here now. It's all, I know you got questions. That's, that's good. I like it. I like for you to get the questions going. And Jordan will answer all your questions. Right, Jordan? You will, won't you? Any other thoughts or comments? Got to, we got to quit. We got to quit. Okay? Read the book. Read the book. It's about the rapture of the church. Uh, if, when, I went to, when I went to another church, I remembered that I didn't know whether they believed it or not and come find out some of them didn't. And it was, uh, we, had to, we had to talk about it for a while to, before we could kind of convince people about it. But there's a lot of people that are struggling about this thing. I'm just going to lay it right out there in front of you and you just, you'll begin to see it. If you don't already, I know most of you do. Any other thoughts or comments about it? We're going to look at that chart right there from now on. That's going to be our number one go-to thing right there. Dwayne, lead us in prayer, brother. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.